Hello and welcome to another video in the engineering kinematics dynamics video series. Today we're looking at rigid body dynamics and the outline for this video is we are first going to look at the equations of motion for a rigid body. Then we're going to discuss how you can go about drawing the free body diagrams of a rigid body. And then lastly, we will go through a few examples on how you can go about solving these rigid body motion problems. So when we look at the equations of motion for a rigid body, there are two equations that are important. We have our translational mo motion, which is in the x, y direction. And those are the sum of all forces equals mass times acceleration. And here acceleration has got a subscript G, which means it's the acceleration of the center of mass. We also have rotational motion. And here Newton's second law is written as the sum of all torques or couple moments around the center of gravity equals the moment of inertia of the center of gravity times rotational acceleration alpha. Next, we need to determine the steps that we need to follow to draw a free body diagram for a rigid body. First, we need to select the coordinate system and this coordinate system will indicate positive translational directions as well as positive rotational direction. We then identify the object we wish to analyze and we sketch its outline shape. Next, we draw all external forces acting on the rigid body and couple moments or torques acting on the object and label them accordingly. Now, the direction of forces having unknown magnitudes can be assumed as their direction will be determined when we solve the problem. The direction of the acceleration of the body's mass center, A, and the angular acceleration alpha should be established on a kinetic diagram. Now let's look at an example of the blot out supersonic car. And first we go and we draw the free body diagram, including all the forces acting on it. So step one, as mentioned before, is to set up a coordinate system indicating both positive translational direction and positive rotational direction. And in this case, the X direction is to the left. The car is moving to the left, so we can just assume that is positive x direction, y direction is vertical upward and positive rotation is clockwise. Step two involves isolating the vehicle from its surroundings. So we're going to draw just the outline of the car and ignore anything outside of that outline. Step three involves marking the applied forces and the reaction loadings. And unlike particle problems, these forces are applied at their actual location. And this is not necessarily the mass center. It can be somewhere else on this object. Obviously, the exception is the object's weight, which always acts through the center of mass. And steps four and five are the same as when we consider particle free body diagrams. All right, and here is our free body diagram of the blood out. You can see clearly we have indicated our coordinate system with X to the left being positive, Y upward being positive, and we've got a positive couple moments in the clockwise direction. We've also indicated all the forces that's acting on the blood out supersonic car. So we have thrust force of the engine being applied to the left. We have our weight of the car going through the center of mass pointing downwards. And then we have the two reaction forces on the wheels of the car where we have got a reaction force at the front of the wheel of the car as well as the rear wheel of the car. And then at the bottom, we just drew the kinetic diagram showing that the car is moving to the left. You will see here it's only translational movement. There isn't any rotational movement in this case. Now that we've drawn the free body diagram, the next step would be to go and solve for all the unknowns. And this process is very similar to that for particle problems. We've just drawn the free body diagram and kinetic diagram. And now we need to apply Newton's second law to the three body and kinetic diagrams. And in rigid body dynamics, we need to use both the translational and rotational motion equations. So let's just go back to our free body diagram. And now the same as for particle problems, we can apply Newton's second law for both translation and rotation. Newton's second law in vector form is the sum of all forces equals m, m equals mass times acceleration. And this is our thrust force vector, our two reaction vectors, and the weight of the car. We can break this equation into its components, its x and y components. And you can see for the x components, we just have the thrust force in the positive x direction. For the forces in the y direction, we have our two reaction forces at the front and the rear wheels. And they both got positive, um, positive signs because they are upwards and we've denoted up as being positive. And then we have negative 
mg, which is the weight of the car acting downwards in the negative y direction. And this equals zero as there is no movement in the y direction. The only movement is on the x direction. So we can put this equation equal to zero. Now for rotation, the torques are being taken around the mass center. And we've said that Newton's second law for rotation is the sum of all torques equals the moment of inertia around the center of gravity times rotational acceleration alpha. You can see here, we consider the reaction force on the front wheel first, and we've got this torque arm of 4.75 meters. And if we go and re-rotate re this force around the center of gravity, it will be a clockwise motion. So our couple moment as a result of the reaction force at the front wheel is a positive as our convention is clockwise is positive. For the reaction force at the rear wheel, again, we've got a moment arm here of 4.15 meters. And if we rotate this force around the center of gravity, it will be in an anti-clockwise motion and that is why it is negative 4.15 times the reaction force at the rear wheel. The same goes for the thrust force. It is rotating in an anti-clockwise manner around the center of gravity and that is why it's got a negative unit here as well. Now as before we assume the jet force is 20% of its maximum hence we give the thrust force a value of 18 kilonewtons and the mass of the blood out supersonic car is 6,422 kilograms. Now we can start inputting the known values into the equations that we've just created. Now, if we look at all the forces in the X direction, it is just the thrust force equals MA, and we can quickly calculate the acceleration in the X direction as being 2.8 meters per second squared. Now, when we consider the Y direction, we can clearly see that there are two unknowns uh, which we cannot solve for, and that is the reaction forces at the front and the rear wheels. So we need a third equation to help us solve these two unknowns. We can use Newton's second law for rotation, which we've written down in the previous slide, and we can substitute the equation that we've got in the previous slide into this equation and we can solve for the reaction force on the rear wheels as 32.13 kilonewtons. Now that we know the value of the reaction force at the rear wheel, the only unknown is the reaction force at the front wheel. So we can substitute the known value for the reaction force at the rear wheel and solve for the value of the reaction force at the front wheel. And we get a value of 30.87 kilonewtons. So by using rigid body dynamics, we have determined the reaction forces of the bloodhound as it accelerates from rest. And we've also determined the acceleration. Now, something that you just need to note is that the axis by which we applied Newton's second law for rotation did not matter here since our rotational acceleration is equal to zero. Let's do another example. If the mass of the crate shown here is 50 kilograms and the coefficient of friction between the crate and the surface is 0.2, determine whether it is likely to tip or slide when we apply the force P and the acceleration for this case, if the force P is equal to 600 newtons. So the first step is to first go and draw the free body diagram of this crate. And we can see here that we've indicated all the forces that we know of. And you can see that the normal force is acting on an arbitrary point O, which is an X direction away from the center of gravity. And we don't know the value of X as this will ultimately influence if the block tips over or it slides. Now to determine if it slides or tips over, we need to first calculate the force to slide the case without tipping it over. And then we do the reverse to see which is smaller. So we can go and apply Newton's second law in the horizontal direction, which gives us the equation of the sum of forces equals MA. And in this case, it's our external force P minus our frictional force. Now for the scenario, where the case is standing still and it's at the point of moving, the external force needs to be equal to the frictional force. And in this case, P needs to be greater than 98.1 newtons in order for the case to slide forward and start moving. Now we can also look at the reverse scenario where we need to determine the value of P that will cause the case to tip over. And we can use Newton's second law for rotation about the center of gravity which is the sum of all the torque forces equals zero. It is equal to zero because there's no rotational acceleration. For the scenario where the case tips over, the value of X needs to be at the point of the case and thus needs to have a value of 0.5 meters. So we can substitute the value of X of 0.5 meters and we can solve for the value of P, which in this case is 654 newtons which is much greater than the applied force of 600 newtons, which means that the case will slide 
and not to over. So now we use the value of P for 600 newtons, which equation states it needs to be, and we calculate the acceleration at which this case will accelerate, and we get a value 10 meters per second squared. We can write this acceleration in the vector form, and because it's only in the x direction, it will only have an i component, and we can write the acceleration as a equals 10i meters per second squared. So in summary, when we look at rigid body dynamics, we always use Newton's second law for translational motion as well as rotational motion. We always need to first go and draw a free body diagram of the problem before we can solve it. And we need to always first select a coordinate system indicating the positive translational directions and positive rotational directions. We need to identify the object we wish to analyze and sketch its outline. Next, we need to draw all the external forces acting on the particle and couple moments acting on the object and label them. And the direction of forces having unknown magnitudes can be assumed as its direction will be determined when we solve the problem. The direction of the acceleration of the body's mass center A and alpha should be established on a kinetic diagram or in the coordinate axis. After we've drawn the free body diagram, we can then go and use Newton's second law for translational and rotational motion to solve all the unknowns. And that's it. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next video. Bye.